This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. As we continue with part two of our interview with the Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative reporter James Risen, who left The New York Times in August to join The Intercept as senior national security correspondent, and this week published a 15,000-word story headlined The Biggest Secret, My Life as a New York Times Reporter in the Shadow of the War on Terror. In the story, Jim Risen gives a personal account of his struggles to publish significant stories involving national security in the post-9-11 period, and how both the government and the top Times editors suppressed his reporting on stories, including the Bush administration's warrantless wiretapping program, for which he ultimately would win the New York Times a Pulitzer Prize in 2006. He describes how a story uh, would have come out right before the 2004 presidential election of President Bush over John Kerry, potentially changing the outcome of that election. But under government pressure, The Times caved, refused to publish the story for more than a year, until Jim Risen was publishing a book that would have the revelations in it. In this new piece for The Intercept, James Risen also describes meetings between top Times editors and officials at the CIA and the White House. Risen was, was not only pursued by the Bush administration, but by the Obama administration as well, Eric Holder, attorney general, as part of a six-year leak investigation into his book, State of War, The Secret History of the CIA and the Bush Administration. His refusal to name a source would take him to the Supreme Court. He almost wound up in jail until the Obama administration blinked. The, his answer to that saga was to write another book, Pay Any Price, Greed, Power and Endless War. Um, so, Jim Risen, in this second part of our conversation, uh, at the end of part one, you took us to the brink, to the Obama administration blinking, um, yeah. not and explain what they decided in 2015. I mean, this is, I, I want to stress, I mean, this is after pursuing you for years, you were pursued by the Bush administration as well, but all through this time, you're still reporting on these administrations for The New York Times. Yeah, that was, that was very odd, because sometimes I would have to call the FBI or the Justice Department or the CIA for comment about stories while I was under subpoena and while they were trying to put me in jail. And uh, it was very weird, because I had to have this, like, dual personality of one trying to continue to report, wow, you're also the subject of this massive investigation. And uh, it was very odd. It was very difficult for me uh, to focus on continuing to report uh, because, of, because of all that going on. It, sometimes it felt like uh, I, was, I had two, two different lives. Uh, and. Uh, so that was weird. <laughs> but I think that the thing that I never, you know, a lot of people in the press uh, have, have kind of given Obama a pass on the way he dealt with uh, press freedom issues. And I think that's a big mistake. I think Obama was every bit as anti-press as Bush was. Uh, and I think there was something uh, deeply ingrained in the way he viewed the press that allowed him to justify the way he was letting the Justice Department go after whistleblowers and reporters. Uh, and I don't think it was, you know, a lot of reporters at the time tried to write stories that, oh, this is just, you know, a continuation of old stories that the Bush administration had, had started looking into. Uh, or that, you know, the Obama people are being forced to do this because of uh, right-wing pressure or whatever. I just think that uh, that that's an excuse. They actively pursued these cases. They had they developed uh, a very hardcore approach to the press, uh, and they used the Justice Department as a weapon against the press. Well, I mean, the Obama administration uh, pursued more whistleblowers than all previous administrations combined. 
Yes. And I want to now go to the former CIA officer Jeffrey Sterling, serving a three and a half year sentence for leaking classified information to you, the, uh, the New York Times, uh, to you, James Risen, about a failed U.S. effort to undermine Iran's nuclear program, the piece you described earlier in your first part of the, uh, the interview. Um, you later exposed how the risky operation could have actually aided the Iranian <coughs> nuclear program. In 2015, Jeffrey Sterling was convicted of nine felony counts, including espionage. His case was the subject of the documentary short, The Invisible Man. This is a clip. They already had the machine geared up against me. The moment that they felt there was a leak, every finger pointed to Jeffrey Sterling. The, the word retaliation is not thought of when anyone looks at the experience that I've had with the agency, then I just think you're not looking. So that's Jeffrey Sterling, a former CIA officer who was African American, serving three and a half year sentence for leaking classified information to you, though you would not reveal your source. Talk about the significance of what happened to Jeffrey Sterling. Well, I can't discuss uh, who uh, you know, anything about who might might have been my source or not. I can't discuss my sources uh, or anything about that uh, matter, uh, because it's uh, still something that I just uh, refuse to discuss anything about anyone who uh, might or might not have ever been a source of mine uh, in this case. But in the in this case of just the way you have covered whistleblowers and what had happened to uh, Jeffrey Sterling as part of the Obama administration's pursuit of whistleblowers, can you comment? Yeah, I think I think uh, as I said in the in my piece, I think it was very shameful what's happened uh, in this case and all the other uh, cases where they have turned uh, leak investigations into massive witch hunts. Uh, and I, I describe in the story uh, how, uh, the, you know, before the Valerie Plame case, there really was no, you know, the government didn't do this kind of uh, aggressive pursuit of leaks, that they allowed leaks to uh, leak, you know, leak investigations basically didn't go anywhere before the Plame case uh, in 2004, and that it really was uh, Patrick Fitzgerald and his hard-headed approach to the subpoenaing reporters in the Valerie Plame case that I think had the unintended consequence of leading to many more leak investigations and to the subpoenaing of reporters and to the targeting of, uh, of people throughout the government. So I think that had a—, a and then after uh, the Plame case, the Obama administration came in and took a zero-tolerance approach to all leaks and made it, uh, instead of something that was a, uh, a backwater uh, a put thing, something put on the back burner of the Justice Department, as it had been for years, suddenly they made, made leak prosecutions and leak investigations a top priority. Jim Risen, the issue of who gets prosecuted, who gets jailed, and who ultimately gets celebrated and gets off the hook. Uh, you write about this in your piece for The Intercept, The Biggest Secret, and you talk about a story that really shaped your reporting. This is before the September 11, 2001 attacks. You write, one incident left me questioning whether I should continue as a national security reporter. In 2000, John Millis, a former CIA officer who had become staff director of the House Intelligence Committee summoned me to his small office on Capitol Hill. Talk about—take uh, it from there. Take it from after he closed the door. Sure. Uh, John Millis uh, opened—he took out a classified document, which was a, an inspector general's report from the CIA on how uh, John Deutsch, who had been the CIA director, had mishandled uh, classified information on his computer and how the investigation into that had been mishandled by top senior uh, CIA officials and that nothing had been done, basically, 
uh, about Deutsch. And it was a very devastating IG report, which had been never been made public before. And uh, Millis read me the whole story, the whole uh, uh, report, and went back over it uh, whenever I needed to, so I could write it uh, verbatim, write it down exactly uh, what was in the report. And I wrote a story about that report, uh, which was very explosive at the time, because it raised questions about uh, the way that this investigation had been handled inside the CIA and how basically nothing had been done to Deutsch and how George Tenet and other people at the CIA had kind of, uh, you know, put, you know, put this whole thing on the back burner. And um, Millis, a few months later, committed suicide. And I was, I went to his funeral, which was attended uh, by hundreds of CIA people. And I felt, I wasn't sure whether my, you know, the story I had done and the leak from him had anything to do with his uh, committed suicide. But I felt like I was in a very weird, dangerous world that I didn't quite understand. And he, I, for this piece that I just wrote, I talked to his widow, and she agreed that it was okay to say, finally, that tell this story about him, and also that she said that she doesn't believe his suicide had, had anything to do with uh, that leak or that story. But it was, uh, it was a real uh, strange, strange interlude in my career. You know, as you may remember, after that, Deutsch, you know, I think the investigation after that uh, into Deutsch's uh, handling of classified information suddenly uh, got, re, you know, reignited after my story. And uh, finally, I think, uh, uh, as I recall, President Clinton gave him a pardon on the way out mm. of office. So you have um, both John Deutsch— and you have David Petraeus. Yeah. Yeah, Petraeus was, uh, as you remember, remember he was a uh, CIA director under, for Obama and was, uh, became, came under investigation for, uh, you know, his mishandling of classified information in a very convoluted story. Uh, and he just got a slap on the wrist in the end. Uh, didn't go. Didn't have to go to jail. Uh, and it's become clear that top officials, uh, if you're powerful enough and wealthy enough, and if you're in a well enough connected, you know, uh, leak investigations will not ruin your career, your life, uh, and you won't face jail time. But if you're lower level uh, officials. Uh, throughout the government, you know, they can, they will go after low-level people who are not uh, powerful. So, Jim, you have the whistleblowers and you have the reporters. And I wanted to go back to your story about Michael Hayden trying to suppress the story, the former head of the CIA. Before that, he led the NSA, the National Security Agency. He was speaking in 2014 to 60 Minutes' Leslie Stahl um, and said that he didn't think that you, James Risen, should be forced to divulge your source. I'm conflicted. I know the damage that is done. And I do. But I also know the free press necessity in a free society. And it, it actually might be that I think, no, he's wrong. That was a mistake. That's a, that was a terrible thing to do. America will suffer because of that story. But then I have to think about, so how do I redress that? And if the method of redressing that actually harms the broad freedom of the press, that's still wrong. <laughs> The government needs to be strong enough to keep me safe, but I don't want it so strong that it threatens my liberties. So that's Michael Hayden. Your thoughts, Jim, as uh, he was the one who brought down the hammer on your story, and now he's saying you shouldn't have to reveal your source. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember when uh, I, when he said that, I thought that was uh, a good— I'm glad he had seemed to have had a change of heart uh, about the press. Uh, and I know he is now— uh, a pretty big critic of the of Trump, uh, and so it's interesting. You know, people can change; they can change their minds, which is good. Uh, and I'm uh, 
that makes me more hopeful, I guess. It's possible, you know, I don't know whether he always felt that way uh, about, you know, sending reporters to jail or not, but it's good that he uh, felt that way at the time. And I want to stay back um, in that period of 2000 um, and go to the story that you write about here of Wen Ho Lee. Now, mm -hmm. if people were wondering what the CIA and the FBI were doing before 9-11, um, let's talk about the story of this Chinese-American scientist at Los Alamos, Wen Ho Lee, a story mm -hmm. that you extensively covered. Explain yeah. what happened and what you learned from this story. Well, uh, we I was working on a story. Um, it was basically about uh, about the Clinton administration and whether or not they were being uh, too too soft on China, on um, and that led into a story about Chinese espionage. And it, it kind of it kind of in other words, I kind of came at this story indirectly. First, looking at Clinton administration policies towards China on technical issues, and then uh, the way they were handling espionage, and then specifically, we began to hear that they were uh, had been soft on this specific uh, espionage case that involved uh, someone at Los Alamos, and um, eventually wrote a story about this. Uh, purported uh, espionage case at Los Alamos and uh, involving a Chinese-American scientist as the uh, main suspect at the time. And looking back, I realized that the way we I wrote that story and wrote the following stories, I wasn't skeptical enough of the way the government, uh, of, of what the government was uh, saying or doing in the case and its handling of the case. And um, I really believe that we should have been more skeptical. And uh, it was a it was a very uh, difficult learning experience for me. And uh, I think I've learned from the mistakes that I made in that case. I want to play an excerpt from my interview in 2005 with Bill Richardson, then the Democratic governor of New Mexico, former ambassador to the United Nations and former secretary of energy. As energy secretary, Richardson fired Wen Ho Lee, who was under investigation for espionage. Uh, Lee was ultimately cleared of those charges. Governor Richardson, this isn't only a case of freedom of the press and journalists protecting their sources. It is also a case of the destruction of uh, uh, the reputation of a man, Wen Ho Lee, who served um, uh, almost a year in prison, um, who uh, a federal judge has said, you last month were the probable source of the leaks. What do you say uh, to that federal judge? And you say you stand behind everything you did in this case. What do you stand by? Well, I stand by that I, I wasn't. And secondly, this was a man that was convicted on several counts of uh, tampering with uh, classified information. So, But the minorest of counts, I mean, what he well, was originally— Well, no, it, it was not minor. This is where you're wrong. It was not minor. There were very sensitive nuclear secrets that possibly were compromised and were improperly taken from his computer. Now, uh, the judgment of the judge I believe is speculative, but uh, I stand behind the very strong actions that I took to protect our nuclear secrets. So you say the federal judge is wrong in saying that you're the problem? Absolutely. The He's lakes. totally wrong. Uh -huh. I mean, in the case of Wen Ho Lee, though, originally they said he could be a reason for the possible, like, well, like President Bush used in the argument for the Iraq War, he could be the source of a nuclear explosion, a bombing of the United States. And ultimately, when the judge freed Wen Ho Lee, he said he had been egregiously misled by government officials about what Wen Ho Lee was responsible for. And he was irate. He was enraged. The judge, I mean. Well, that's his opinion. Um... I believe that we acted properly in safeguarding our nuclear secrets. He was convicted on several counts. Uh, there were some mistakes in that case. 
It involved the entire federal government, and I stand behind everything that I did. That's former New Mexico Governor Richardson, who fired Wen Ho Lee, uh, who was part of— it was not only the government, but also, I guess, your reporting in The New York Times um, that led to this kind of witch hunt against mm -hmm. Wen Ho Lee. I mean, mm -hmm. he would be followed by FBI agents when he rock climbed. They would be hanging from uh, rocks nearby because they just were following him. Um, mm -hmm. They destroyed, ultimately, his life. And mm -hmm. in the end, he was not charged with any of the original charges, simply mishandling uh, government information. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I know. It was, uh, it was a, it, as I said, I think the, the criticism of the stories that I did is valid. And um, it was, a, a, as I said, it was a real learning experience. And I think it helped me become more skeptical of the government uh, and, uh, in a way, help me avoid uh, some of the uh, uh, problems on the uh, pre-war intel on Iraq. I think the fact that I had gone through that experience and had become more skeptical of the government helped me become more skeptical of the government just before the war in Iraq. And then, of course, you had the war in Iraq, and you were then asking serious questions. Your pieces weren't making it to the front page of The New York Times in the way Michael Gordon and Judith Miller's pieces alleging weapons of mass destruction were. Would you say that The New York Times was really campaigning for war on its news pages? Well, it, you know, it felt like, at the time, it felt like they didn't want the stories that I was writing. Um, it was uh, they didn't want to hear, or they didn't really. I, I wrote a series of stories that were skeptical about uh, the pre-war intelligence, and they would either get cut or buried, uh, or you know, held for long periods of time, and uh, it was very frustrating. And that was, you know, going on in late 2002 and early 2003, and that for me, was like the prelude to what happened on the later stories on the CIA, Iran, and then the NSA. So I had this whole period where I was very frustrated uh, that ultimately led, you know, that, that frustration ultimately led to what I did with my book and the NSA story. So it was, it was all part of a continuous period for me of deep frustration. Mm. So, as we wrap up, your reflections on the role of the press, and particularly your paper that is so critical, your former paper, The New York Times, um, in holding those in power accountable, um, in being not a part of the state, but and not a party to the parties, but apart from them. Yeah, I think, I, I, as I said in my piece, I think there's some mixed results from the, all these battles uh, in the post-9-11 age. I think, I think the press in general, including The New York Times and The Washington Post and a lot of other major news organizations, hasn't really learned the lessons of the uh, pre-war uh, WMD uh, debacle in the press. I think we are still hyping terrorist threats and hyping WMD threats in some cases. And I think that leads—that has a major political impact, and it makes it very difficult for anyone in Congress or the White House or any, any political leader to roll back some of the uh, most draconian uh, laws and policies that have been put in place uh, since 9-11, uh, including the domestic spying programs. Uh, on the other hand, at The New York Times, I think the fight over the NSA story really helped usher in a change in the way that they deal with the government. Uh, the paper is now much more aggressive on national security reporting in, and much less willing than uh, ever, than it was before the NSA story to agree to hold or kill stories. Uh, at the government's request. Uh, it's, uh, you know, they, they require a much higher bar. Uh, you know, they still negotiate on stories when, in, when the government wants to negotiate, but I think they're much more willing to say no to the government today. And I think uh, 
you know, the experience on the NSA story had was a big factor in changing that, uh, the way they think about that. And, Jim, one of the things you write about is the fact that you found out, through the case against you, through discovery, that there was, to say the least, a, a major FBI file on you. Can you talk about what you learned? Yeah, I found uh, my lawyers uh, filed a FOIA, you know, Freedom of Information Act requests with several agencies, and uh, they wouldn't give me any information about uh, the current case, but they were they, to my great surprise, they we started getting these old files on old uh, leak investigations that they had done of my stories, uh, earlier stories. And I was, uh, it was amazing to see all these old leak investigations that I never knew had taken place. And the reason I never knew about them is because they dropped them and they never pursued them. And uh, one of the, one of the documents showed, you know, had, had the, uh, said it was the FBI was recommending that it be closed and shut down uh, because they hadn't, you know, really found anything. And I think there was a, as I said before, this earlier period where no one really wanted to go to the mat, uh, go to the mat on uh, leak investigations. They just, uh, everyone knew that there was this informal understanding between the press and the government, and they just uh, would would uh, go through the motions of leak investigations. And it's only been in the last few years where that's changed, and that's it's made Washington a much more uh, difficult place to do uh, aggressive reporting. Were they surveilling you? Were they following you, Jim Risen? Uh, not as far as I know. Not, not uh, physical surveillance all the time, as far as I know. Uh, but I do—there was—I describe a, a very strange uh, incident that's happened recently, actually, in the last couple of years, where I was—the uh, FBI set up what I've been—what's been described to me as an ambush of uh, what they thought was going to be a meeting between me and a source. And uh, that meeting didn't happen, so the ambush didn't take place. But I had uh, been given evidence that they were thinking about uh, pursuing that uh, in a way to try to uh, find out, uh, find a source of mine. And uh, so I, that's, that was very disconcerting to, to find out that. Hmm. Uh, and finally, the FISA Reauthorization Act that they have punted to January 19th, the significance of this? Well, you know, the the uh, after our NSA story uh, in 2000, late 2005, Congress began to finally uh, grapple with how to deal with uh, the NSA domestic spying program. And in 2008, they passed uh, what they called the FISA Reor Reauthorization Act, or FISA Amendments Act, I mean. And that basically gave Bush unfortunately, uh, most of what it made legal most of what he had been doing under the domestic spine program. And uh, that FISA Amendments Act uh, then was still in place, uh, has, has been reauthorized, I think, a couple times, and has uh, then, when Edward Snowden came out with uh, his documents, uh, there were some tweaks to that, uh, limiting certain things. But it's basically still the FISA Amendments Act of 2008 is still uh, generally the the uh, law, and they so I think they're re just reauthorizing that. The for a while there were some Republicans over the last few years who were libertarian who were opposed to uh, uh, domestic spying, but there's been very little constituency, unfortunately, in the United States for civil liberties. And uh, it's very easy politically to demagogue on uh, terrorist threats, and it makes it very difficult for uh, politicians to fight back and actually reduce the, the power of the government. Mm.
Well, James Risen, I want to thank you so much for spending this time with us. James Risen, the Intercept senior national security correspondent, best-selling author, former New York Times reporter. His new piece for The Intercept is titled The Biggest Secret, My Life as a New York Times Reporter in the Shadow of the War on Terror. We'll link to it at democracynow.org, as well as part one of our hour conversation with the Pulitzer Prize-winning journalists. James Risen. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.